Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the Band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 220 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Scott Anderson from Finger 11, I want to let you know about the Mistress Carrie birthday bash happening Saturday night, September 28th at 8 p.m., at Rascals in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's a 21-plus party featuring the music of Rotten Apple and Justin Jordan. Tickets are on sale now, and you can get the details on the concert calendar at mistresscarry.com. Scott Anderson is the lead singer from Finger Eleven, who's out on the road right now with Creed on the Summer of 99 tour. The band just signed a new record deal, has a new album on the way, and has just released their new single, Adrenaline. It's a whole new era of Finger Eleven. Scott and I talked about the formation of the band with friends from middle school. And we talked about the ups and downs of their career. And, of course, Spinal Tap. We talked about touring and movies, parenting, and the future of the band. And, of course, the upcoming new album. You can see Creed, Three Doors Down, and Finger Eleven at the Xfinity Center in Mansfield, Massachusetts on August 21st. I was so happy that Scott accepted my invitation to be on the show. So, allow me to introduce you to Scott Anderson from Finger Eleven. Hello, Scott. Thanks for hanging out with me this afternoon. (laughs) No problem at all. How's it going? It's going good. First question I always ask, and it looks like I already know the answer. Do you know where you are and are you home? Well, you know, it's, I'm not at home. And I usually, when I'm on the road, I, it's, 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 it's a 50 50 whether I know where I am, but I've been in the same place for two days. So uh, I do know where I am. I'm in Nashville. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I win this round. There are so many artists that have come on the show and talked about the metal and rock invasion of Nashville, that it's no longer the hub of country music. The rockers have completely taken over Nashville. I mean, that's cool. You just walk down the street and it's just music this, music that. I mean, it's wonderful. I had never been there until a couple years ago. And then I kind of walked around and I was like, wow, this city is just really built on music. Not, I thought there were going to be like longhorn cattle walking down the middle of the road and belt buckles and five gallon hats. And it's just a city built on music in general. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, the, yeah, the, the city is great. We, we made a record here, but it was sort of on the outskirts. We made it, you know, in the suburbs in the, in, in a basement, which a lot of, you know, records are, uh, out here. So, um, we didn't get to experience Nashville that much back then but i've spent two days here and you know i'm running around having a good time so it's good did you bump into anybody weird like just walking around because it's one of those things where if you just walk down broadway and like look into the different bars and stuff like lizzie hale just jumped up on stage with a cover band because she walked by and they were playing hailstorm like that stuff happens in nashville all the time I just, I noticed somebody walking out of a Starbucks that looked like they hadn't seen daylight for a while. And I thought, that's a musician. That's absolutely a musician. (laughs) Just going back to like their hovel to create the next big thing. Well, there's a lot going on with Finger Eleven. And the first thing is you guys just signed a new record deal. It's like a whole new era with the band with better noise. So it's like, is it a rebirth? What's the best way to describe this new kind of phase with Finger Eleven? Well, it's pretty exciting. Um, 
I guess what it represents to us is uh, somebody outside the band is excited about our new project. Uh, they're as excited as we are. And that's always the goal. Um, and when, when you have a label that believes in you, they're able to, you know, uh, expand and take it to the next level and do things you can't do on your own as a band. So, uh, it just makes the, it makes it easier for the band to concentrate on what they want to do creatively. And it just gives the band more opportunities. So it's very exciting, you know, so we, we've been doing what we've been doing and trying to create cool stuff. And, uh, now it's going to be just, uh, a little bit like it feels like the old days already where it's like, wow, okay, we're busy. This machine's starting up. This is very exciting. So it's a really neat time for finger 11. It's a really amazing time in rock right now because of this resurgence of like late nineties, early two thousands. I mean, look, you guys are going out on the road with Creed who at one point was the punchline of every music joke and now they're bigger, better than ever, Super Bowl commercials, sold out amphitheater tours. I mean, nobody I think could have predicted that all of the music from that era would be bigger now than it was back then. Yeah, um, it, it's 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 amazing to, to be on a tour and you've got 20,000 people uh, losing their minds and there's, there's all kinds of different music fans. We go out there and, you know, it's, uh, it's really, it's really communal, uh, like a, like a big concert can be, but it, whatever your opinion might be before the concert, if you go out there and you're part of it, you are going to have an excellent time. You're just going to, despite your, you're just going to be able to, um, uh, you know, shed all, you know, whatever cynicism you had about, uh, uh, the, you'll get it basically is what I'm saying. It's such a neat, it's such a neat thing. You go, you'll go in with a different, you'll come out with a different attitude rather if you're not a fan, but um, boy, Creed has his fans now and they, they have come to see the show. Well, they've got the songs, right? And at the end of the day, it all comes down to the song and, and the cycle that they've been on the same thing with Nickelback, right? They got to the highest of highs and then they, they got so much hate to the point where they made a documentary about it. And I tell people Dimebag Daryl was a fan of Nickelback. So are you going to tell me Dimebag Daryl was wrong? Because at the end of the day, the songs are good. They're great. One of the one of the greatest things Chad Kroger ever said to me was uh, when we, I think when we charted, when we got like maybe our first hit, he's like, oh, congratulations, you're going to have haters now. <laughs> and I thought, what a high class problem. He's right. That's so cool. But yeah, you can't you can't get to their level without the songs. And, you know, it's it's nice when they uh, stand the test of time and you, you're not just going to fill those giant arenas by accident time and time again. Somebody told me when I started my radio career that until I started getting hate comments and hate mail that I wasn't doing a good enough job. <laughs> and they were right. Yeah, it's just like, uh, no matter what, it it's never feels good, but it's like, okay, that's showbiz, cool. Yeah. I joke all the time, because I've known Brad Arnold and the guys from Three Doors Down for a really long time. And I've made the joke several times that there are very few decisions I made in high school that I would go back and make again and decisions that I made in high school that completely changed the trajectory of my entire life. That is something you and Three Doors Down have in common, that Finger Eleven came from decisions you made in high school that were actually good. <laughs> I'll, I'll go you one better. I think I was in middle school when I met James and... We said, okay, from 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 the point I learned he could play guitar, uh, I wanted to play drums. And I said, okay, buddy, we're gonna be, we're gonna get together every weekend and we're gonna and we're gonna learn songs. Whatever. We went to like <laughs> we went to the music store and I remember we bought the uh the musical notation for Pink Floyd's uh, a momentary lapse of reason. But like James could sort of read music. I couldn't read music. I didn't know what we thought we were gonna do, learn the whole thing. But it that that was sort of beside the point it was that conviction and that arrogance of saying yeah yeah this is what we're gonna do of course we are you know i got one real job i worked at a gas station uh while well, i was a janitor for a sandwich shop for a little while and you know i did apply to college but there was a, a decision point where okay well 
do I go to college or do we stay a band? And it was easy. I was like, okay, we're just going to stay a band. Absolutely, incredibly, that's a crazy decision. It's like you say, I don't, I, I look back and I, I, I had no backup plan, but uh, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's wild. All my friends were in bands. We got very, very lucky, uh, you know, but I will say we were committed and we're still committed. So we still had that going for us. You are one in a very long list of vocalists that had that original dream of being a drummer. When, mm-hmm. when, did, that, when did that dream die for you? Here's, here's exactly when the dream died, because I met James in middle school, and we went to different high schools, and I found this fantastic drummer in high school. And we, had to, we wanted to play a talent show, so we hired him for like a case of beer. And then we're like, okay, this is working out really good. So I basically got kicked out of the drumming position because he was so good. And guess the what? Like we didn't have a singer. So I was like, all right, I can, I'll try. I'll do that. And here I am. What, you had never been a singer before that? You weren't that kid running around the house singing? I, I, I definitely was. I was like the, I was interested in like, like the drama club and, um, I would I would mow the lawn and you know put on my Walkman and like sing along to my favorite records, but yeah. So I did know, I, I it wasn't like a, yeah, it was it was it was the default position, but I did have a passion for singing. That's true. Does musical ability run in the family? Were you surrounded by people showing you that that it was something that you could be good at? Um. My grandfather was like he my my dad would always say he really liked to play the fiddle and I have an uncle that's a really good guitarist but um it, I don't know if necessarily my passions came directly from my family but it was it was clear early on like all I wanted to do every weekend was I like, go down to the record shop and spend all the money I had <laughs> on music and you know rinse and repeat yeah you know? so that was that was kind of it for some reason music became more important than anything um really early so it was doing something very special and very, uh, you know, it, it, it had a stronger grip than even like movies or games, which I, I, I definitely enjoy. But it was just like there's that through line still. Um, I was like, oh, this is this is great. Now, I I remember trying to, you know, like there's there was a point where I could do uh, musical theater and stuff, which is fun to do, but it's not that fun to uh, watch, in my opinion. But uh, it it doesn't hold a candle to rock and roll at all. Like to be with your band and to be together and to, you know, make that, make that noise. It's uh, <laughs> I, so there were a few crossroads where rock and roll won every single time. <laughs> I have a theory about music that there is kind of two eras of your musical life. There is the soundtrack to your childhood, the music you get exposed to unwillingly by your parents, your siblings, the cool uncle, and then you hear something and you make the decision that you like that. And from then on, your musical identity shows up. So what was the soundtrack to your childhood? And then what was it that changed it all for you? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, there was there was a point where there was uh, nothing else I listened to except for Genesis Records and Iron Maiden. And that's the result of having an older brother. Uh, I mean... But what the what Genesis records teach you is like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> like a prog rock, like perfect uh, pop music, you know, ballads, you know, the, it, it, it kind of has everything. So um, that's that that's still and, you know, Iron Maiden, I mean, come on, forget it. But uh, so I still hold on to those. I don't look back and go like, ah, what was I thinking? You know, there's there's some music that I haven't taken with me, but um, there was. I will say, you know, I had like a early on, if I didn't understand music or if I didn't like it, I, there was too much hate. Like I didn't understand the Smiths. I didn't understand Morrissey. And then it maybe in my late twenties, my roommate was playing it and it, it, it hit me. I was like, Whoa, hold on, hold on. Listen to how he's saying that. Listen to those words. That's, that's pretty cool. So, uh, <laughs> you know, there, um, I was just happy that, you know, t- I, trying to break out of like the the rules of what was good and what I hated and like maybe like revisiting things was nice because, you know, even nowadays where I, I, I used to think like Jerry Rafferty was kind of, again, like a, like a, like a punchline, 
And now it's just the most, it's, it's very important to me, <laughs> but I didn't like it back, you know, when I was growing up as a, as a, as a kid. So um, the more rules I, 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 I break for myself musically, the more, uh, the more I can sort of open and, and broaden my horizons. So I, I don't know, I'm still trying to collect uh, all those things. Um, but I'd say like the, the anchor for me is probably still, you know, Genesis, when you were at the record store spending all of your money, as we all did at that age, just just combing through the racks, which is something that I'm so glad is coming back to a certain extent with the resurgence of vinyl. Mm-hmm. But what are some of the things that you bought back then that you so wish you still had? Because all that stuff is worth so much money now. I know. Uh, I had, um, I have a few, but uh, I remember, I remember buying Power Slave. And that was great because there's no better experience to listen to the to, to listen to your record with like this giant sort of uh, mini mural in front of you, and so you get that 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 level of immersion that just doesn't it doesn't occur anymore. Um, I what else did I I think I had? Well, you know, everybody had that Dark Side of the Moon, which like it came with so much stuff. <laughs> you know, it was like posters and stickers, and you know, you got you got a you got a full experience. Um, but I would just buy those records over and over back then. So it was frustrating. Like I do remember and I love, I love how they sounded and, uh, you know, but it was, I tried to take care of my records as, as much as I could, but I would just stack them all. I had this device where you just, okay, what records do I want to listen to while I'm going to sleep? Well, I'll just stack five records on top of each other and call it a night. And that's a bad way to maintain your records. Um, so you know, my, my favorite things I would just buy over and over. And then, um, I, th- I think I had, there was, there was a really nice, um, one of my favorite records is, uh, my live favorite live records is seconds out by Genesis. And that's great. And they also have, um, they have a three sides live record, which is a different fourth side. Now I can't find it anywhere. Um, that's getting really, really nerdy, but, um, yeah, I the, the the rule is, you know, I, I and so that's why I can't throw any of my CDs out. I've been hurt before. Um, I can't find any of my. I, I threw out my uh, my vinyl, and it, it, you forget. It's like, oh no, no, you're not going to have access to that because uh, you know whatever the uh, the digital archive that you assumed was going to exist, it kind of doesn't. <laughs> so just hold on to all your favorite musical stuff, everyone. Yeah, I haven't gotten rid of any of my stuff. Like, and I even inherited all of my parents' stuff, like the vinyl and the eight tracks. And now the search is trying to find a mechanism to play it all because the machines <laughs> are harder to find than the actual music. Well, that's how. How about that? How about that? Like, is that is that a million dollar idea? Trying to find, like, you know, trying to sort of reinfuse that, get some sort of really good, reliable machine that can play records reliably. I just need a good guy that can fix turntables and eight track machines. Like talk about a budding business to just be able to repair that stuff. Yeah. I would have that guy on the payroll. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's the dream, right? You have enough money where it's like, Oh, what's going on? What's going on, Bob? Come on and fix, (laughs) fix the stuff so I can just enjoy this vintage thing. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise you just spend all your hobbyist time fixing it. You talked about, kind of becoming the default singer of the band. But I know, because I can't do either, that being a musician and a singer and being a songwriter are two very, very different things. When did you realize you could do that? Well, I think I had a lot of help. I mean, first of all, you just you just try it. And I think... Um, the overconfidence of youth helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you just keep trying it and you just your 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 first bunch of stuff is it's going to be very, very bad unless you're some kind of genius and you know that works out too. But um if there's something that uh you know the the best case scenario, there's a piece of music that you're kind of emotionally overwhelmed with, and so you have no choice but to try something. And that's how I feel most of the time when I'm in the band. Uh, they'll give me a piece of music and I'll be just really taken with it or I won't. And that's kind of the stubborn part of it. Um, you know, it's, it's gotta be frustrating for the guys, but if there's something that's really good there, it's like, okay, I'll focus on this and I won't stop until I'm done. I got to figure that I got to carve something out of here. Cause there is something that's speaking to me. Uh, 
and that's it. And then uh, I'll stop when I think it's good. <laughs> you know, I'll stop when I go like, hey, man, yeah, all right, I like this. And then a day later, if I like it, okay, let's work on this, you know? So that's sort of been the formula. I'm fascinated by the trust required in a band where they can bring you a piece of music that they're so proud of and trust that you're going to like it or you're going to have lyrics and you bring them to them and they mean so much to you. Uh, As a non-songwriter, I would be so heartbroken if you poured so much into an idea and everybody hated it. Well, there's a way to break that kind of news. (laughs) You know, there's a respectful way. You can sometimes read between the lines. You know, if you keep bringing up this idea that (laughs) that hasn't been on the table for a while and nobody's biting then you just sort of got to take the L. You got to say, okay, I, uh, there's something uh, that, that 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 I'm hearing and you're not, and, you know, whatever, we can maybe work it out. But it is, it's a big trust exercise. And we're, we're all respectful. Like, there's nobody that's saying, man, that idea is terrible. We'll just say, you know, the only rule is like, okay, cool idea. What if we did this? Or I'm not so sure about that. Like, you can't just uh, throw on negativity and, and not, you know, bat the ball back in some way. So that's sort of one of the only rules. It's a testament to the longtime friendship to the band members too, that you guys have known each other as long as you have and that you've gone through this creative process and all of these different phases of success and failure of being in a band and yet you're still doing it. But you just sort of nailed it because, uh, if, 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 if our only trajectory was, you know, success, like from the beginning, like all this like roller coaster, and then your expectations are just, oh, this is always how the this is always the way it is. Um, then the first bump in the road is just absolute chaos. But you know, um, Finger Eleven's ride is it, it's it's definitely full of peaks and valleys. And uh, you know, if you remember, it took um, three records for us to have sort of like you know quote unquote success. Um, which is unprecedented in, you know, when you're, when you're speaking about, you know, being in the, like the, uh, uh, under a label, <laughs> you know, so um, there's, there's a couple corny fundamental things where like, we're in it for the music. And so, and we're also in it to make something so we can earn enough resources to make something else and then rinse and repeat again. <laughs> so um there, yeah, there's, there's, there's fundamental, there's a fundamental respect there, you know. Um, I also think our secret weapon is my brother in the band, who is basically, uh, he makes sure uh, things don't fall apart at the seams financially, and uh, we're, we're, we are best friends, and there's, um, and we, we share everything now, and there, there, there's, uh, so like everybody, everybody wins if this whole thing uh, works out. So, and, and we're really proud of what's going on musically now. It's not just like, oh yeah, we had these kind of ideas kicking around. It's like, no, wow, there's something, you know, sort of very exciting happening musically. So there's, there's, it's, it's a great, like I said, it's, it it is a great time uh, to be in the band. Like there's, yeah, of course there's, there's, there's discourse and there's fights, but we, we, we get through them and there's a, there's a stronger perspective now. Um, So it's great. There's also that greater level of difficulty, too, with a sibling in the band. I mean, the the stories of rock and roll siblings in bands together going bad. And then it's not just a failure at work, but now you're at Christmas with mom and dad and you're mad at each other. Like, like there is that that danger to it. But when it's good and you figure it out, it's great. Yeah, like it's it, it's tough because everybody keeps everybody else in check. Like I can't go full prima donna as much as I want to, you know. <laughs> it's like, dude, you can't stop, you know. So it's too bad. I want to ask you about songwriting um, because, like I said, I'm fascinated by the process and I can't do it. Tried, failed miserably, shot down in flames. There's got to be a song or two or however many, this isn't a favorite song question, this is a pure craft question, that you think is perfectly written and you wish you wrote it. Any band, any artist, but a song you just look at and go, man, that song is perfect. But then you got to tell me why. 
Oh boy. Oh, there's just so many. Um, well, you know what? Um, how about just, just because it comes to mind, I think right down the line is pretty great. Um, it, well, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a legendary song right down the line by Jerry Rafferty. Um, he always comes from this place where it's like, yeah, I'm a, I am a mess and I am a handful and I, I, I need you to make me as good as I can be. So that's, I think, <laughs> I think every dude on the planet <laughs> think, <laughs> feels that way. <laughs> but, um, to, to have these, you know, like Jim Croce does the same thing where it's like, yeah, I can't, I can't express things to you properly, but here is a, a incredibly written song. I hope you hear it. Um, so to be able to, you know, to, to express feelings, you know, that can't be done so well in real life or are much harder to do and to craft it into a, an incredible musical piece. Um, I think I'm envious of that, uh, very much. I mean, I think there's a, there's a romantic idea where it's like, yeah, hopefully you can, you know, hopefully you can you can fix me, but I, even if you can't, I, um, I appreciate you trying. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about the new album because the new single is out, but the record's not coming out till next year. Right. So tell me what, what the plan is. Okay. Well, we have about half the record done and then there's these ideas that, um, they just need, they, they need a few more passes. So it's, it's still a mystery how it's all going to shake out. Um, but the, the, the trick is we're on tour with, with Creed and it's, it's a, it's a long tour and writing on the road is, is kind of difficult for the band. We're, we're, we're trying, we're trying as best we can, but so far we've got some, you know, some, I think songs that are maybe harder or have like a little more of an edge to them than, your normal finger 11 fans might expect. However, if you've been with us for a while, you know that we, we can go there. There's also a really nice, uh, well, nice is the wrong word, but it's a, it's a more of a mellow song, um, which I really like. And there's, there's going to be, there's going to be a few songs that I, I hope they make it, which kind of fall into like more of the long form kind of, uh, vibier, uh, maybe melancholy uh thing it's it's just going to be there's going to have to be a little bit of alchemy the way there always is where we'll, we get the a bunch of songs that we all feel have like hit the proper levels and it's like okay where do they all sort of can we put them together you know the album is you know the idea of an album is still uh very important to us so i think come october we just got to uh finish up you know the the handful of songs that were that that still need work, and then try to you know smash it together and uh, see how happy we are with it. August twenty first, you're going to be in New England at the Xfinity Center with Creed and Three Doors Down, and then a couple days later, the video for Adrenaline comes out. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be interesting. <laughs> Why do you say it like that? The only reason I say it is because we're on the road and we're 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 currently in the process of making it. Oh. So it's where we're, um, I, I'm going to be as excited as you are to see <laughs> <laughs> rock and roll. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of that, actually, I got to ask you this question because I'm sure you have an answer for it. You say rock and roll, like, like the spinal tap quote, right? That's right. <laughs> I'm glad you caught that. Uh, of course. I think I, I bring it up with almost every interview because spinal tap is just so true. It's not, mm -hmm. it's really more of a documentary than it is a mockumentary and they're making the sequel. So give me your spinal tap moment on stage. Cause you gotta have one where it just all went to hell. Well, I mean, I, I've, I've had like the, 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 I've had the cord rip out of my microphone and me not knowing. Right. Oh. And it's like, <laughs> you know, you, you you you've got that you've um you know it 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 is all it gosh it is all spinal tap but it's it it it's wonderful i'm trying to think 
I mean, I've almost been hit by Rick's guitar so many times <laughs> that I feel like it's, uh, I mean, well, if, you know, it's not exactly Spinal Tap, but, you know, yeah, we're, 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 sometimes we're seconds from disaster, but, uh, yeah, you know, like sometimes, you know, there will be light, sh light cues that don't work or, you know, there's, there's a million things that go wrong in a, uh, well, to quote Spinal Tap again, there's, a, <laughs> and the audience never notices, but, you know, there were, there were, we'll just get so mad. And it's like, this lighting cue is off that, you know, and nobody really cares, but I mean, it is, it's important to care as a band, but uh, I, I mean, I think that's kind of Spinal Tap in itself where it's like, ah, it was supposed to be red on the stage and it was green, you know, and it's like, well, dude, nobody. Okay. All it, right. It amazes me how many singers fall off the stage. Like it's really common. Yeah. Yeah. I have to, you know, if I go to the edge of the stage, all I'm doing is looking down a million times, a million times to ex see exactly where my footing is. You know, I, uh, I very rarely will put my foot up on a monitor that like, that's almost, a, that's a bridge too far for me. And I know that's, I mean, that's rock and roll 101. You're supposed to do that, and I don't do it. <laughs> There's some sort of, like, mental protest there for me. But uh, it's 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 real because there's sometimes, you know, there's not a lot of stage room, but you get excited, and there's there's nerves, and, you, there, you, you know, you're, you're all of a sudden you're making a connection with the audience, and then, woof, you know, boom. I talked to Zach Wild recently, and he told me that Geezer Butler – said that the Stonehenge joke was because of Black Sabbath, because Black Sabbath's set was too big to fit in the arenas, so Spinal Tap made the set too small. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I never knew that, and Zach said that Geezer told him that, that like in the early Sabbath days, that their set was so big that they would get to arenas and it just wouldn't fit inside the venue. Okay, I can't wait to tell the guys that. They're going to love that. <laughs> I can't wait to see this movie. Like, I have seen the movie so many times. Zach said that when Ozzy saw it the first time, he said, I thought it was a documentary about Sabbath. That's how dead <laughs> on it was about the early days of Sabbath. Like, it's one of those movies that if you're going to be in a rock band, you just, you have to love because it's too true to not love it. It is funny. Um, I remember, you know, being, what, 13 years old or something, and I, I, I you know, I, I went to the record store and they had these, um, like, basically like these big tour books, like, I don't know, documentary books, I don't know, sort of like visual biographies. And there was an Iron Maiden one there. It was big, like it was probably like 50 bucks. And it was called Iron Maiden. What are we doing this for? And it was them just like a, a, a like a tour pick. And they were just, you know, just Iron Maiden. And I was insulted by the, by the title. Because I, I thought, well, what are you talking about? What are you doing this for? This is so I can exist. Yeah, I like, need you to mean? breathe. I need Maiden to breathe. <laughs> you know, but it's like, yeah, it's like you're in it, and it's like, yeah, this is all, you know, what 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 are we doing? You know, but I like I like the uh, how how hard Iron Maiden goes, but uh, you know, you you see the live show, and there there's more of a sense of humor than 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 I had with just me and my records, you know. But I, I appreciate it all nowadays. This tour. I mean, we talked about it when we when we first started talking about this career resurgence for a lot of bands. I mean, we're seeing bands like Korn celebrate a 30th anniversary, you know, Slipknot celebrating 25 years, Papa Roach, Linkin Park, these bands getting ready to celebrate these massive anniversaries. And to be able to go out on the road with Creed, Three Doors Down, bands that you've probably toured with before, bands that you've been friends with for a really long time. What does it say to you about the friendships with the other bands and then on a bigger scale, the loyalty of the rock audience that tours like this are even possible all these years later? I mean, I think it's pretty special. It's an absolute honor to be part of this tour. And I mean, I make a point of saying so uh, on most shows, if I can sort of get over myself in the moment. I mean, it's just too many people at the time. But it, truly, it's it's great. There's, um, it, you know, we, we've, um, we've been reacquainted with some of these guys, and it doesn't feel like there's been much time that's gone by or not as much time has actually gone by. Um, but the real trick is having everybody show up 
over and over and over. Like this whole tour is sold out and it's amazing. Now, I don't think it happens without the songs. And there's just some like absolute, um, uh, there's, there's such longevity to some of these, these songs that, um, you do get, um, I think you get more than what you're paying for in a way where it's like, wow, this band sounds great. I remember loving this back then. I love it now. I brought my kid. They think it's cool, you know. And it, it you know, it takes me back to as much as uh, I, I'm in, I'm enjoying the right, I'm enjoying the moment right now. But it's also taking me back, you know. That's that's kind of the vibe I get every single time I watch these people watch the show. All of the bands talk about what a trip it is to look out in the crowd and see the multi-generations of fans. Like you're saying, that that love for this music, just like it was when we were kids listening to the stuff that was in the house, that it gets passed down and all of a sudden you've got, you know, an eight-year-old singing lyrics to Paralyze her when they weren't even freaking born when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've got a four-year-old now and all he wants to listen to is Finger Eleven. And... You know, it's funny you go into your back catalog and I didn't realize how many, uh, how much profanity there is <laughs> and how it's, uh, uh, children aren't supposed to be singing this. You know, so I've got a real problem on my hands that I never thought I'd uh, uh, encounter. But uh, yeah, kids, kids want to kids. I mean, I like that he likes my stuff, but uh, it's a lot. Yeah. And then you go back and think about all the stuff that we grew up listening to. The albums we were buying and hiding from our parents. I'll, I'll tell you something. I, I told on myself, I think it was Van Halen's 5150. And Sammy Hagar said, I think, I can't remember what, what song, but he says, bullshit. And I immediately stopped the tape. <laughs> it's like, I don't, it's, I, it's as if I had a loaded gun in my house. <laughs> I took the tape out and I was like, I got to return this. I don't think I can do this. And, uh, and I returned 5150. That's uh, what a what a what a knucklehead move. In the grand scheme of like rebellious rock albums, 5150 isn't even in the top 1000. So so what was like, man, I should have just relaxed a little bit. <laughs> the Sammy Hagar era of Van Halen is definitely like, I, not satanic death metal. That's for sure. I've got number of the beast in my room and that's OK. <laughs> But Sammy Hagar saying bullshit is a no. bridge too far. No, no, no. Like, and my parents are like, hey, what do you? Well, we don't care. <laughs> but you do listen to everything differently when you're like, I don't have my own kids, but I, ha I, I inherited teenagers when I got married, my bonus kids. And what's really funny is that like the music I love, they're just like, nah. I got them to listen to some rock stuff, but like. It's so funny to listen to stuff you love, but with completely different ears. Yes, yes, it's it, it's it's a weird experience. It's like um, introducing a movie that you really like to your friends. Like you you get to see it through a different lens, and I kind of don't love it. Like there's there's a lot at stake. Yeah. There's too much at stake, you know. So I need to again. I need to relax. If there's if there's a really if it's a piece of music I really like, and I, I introduce it to the guys or. Um, you know, my, my future son, I got to just sort of pump the brakes a little bit as far as enthusiasm goes. I think that's the way forward. And like with the movies you talk about, like we've gone back, especially around the holidays when you get some extra time off and you want to show them the movies you grew up listening to. So like we watched Back to the Future, which they loved, which I was so happy because if they hated it, it would have been so crushing because I love that movie so much. In, I think you picked a good one. That's kind of bulletproof, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll go. I'll 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 I'll, I'll save you a. Uh, well, no, you you the the kids are teens, right? But yeah. uh, James has been telling me that he's been they've been watching Gremlins uh, every Christmas. And if you remember, there's a really dark um, uh, monologue, and so James has to every time James has to <laughs> distract his kid or like fast forward through that part. So like they just sort of they they skip over really really quick. But some of those movies that we don't remember the traumatic parts, they have some traumatic parts to them. Yeah. And I made them watch the original Top Gun because I'm like, you don't get to watch Maverick unless you watch the first one so you get the jokes. 
I mean, the second one is so good. You almost don't need to. But watch they the first do, one. Like, though. But they <laughs> do. Okay. You know what? Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Don't question my parenting style. You, you know, listen, I, I don't I don't want I don't want to fight. I'm so sorry. <laughs> What's the movie that you're watching on the bus? You're on the road, the the you're in the lounge, you're on a 12-hour drive with guys you've been in a band with since high school. We already talked Spinal Tap, but what are the movies that Finger Eleven quotes on tour all the time that you guys can all agree to watch for the thousandth time when you're stuck on the bus? Well, we actually we just watched Ghostbusters. That that was easy. That's a slam dunk. Bulletproof, you know? bulletproof yeah, movie. It, it really is. Um, have you ever seen the documentary American Movie? I don't know. It's a it's about an aspiring filmmaker in Wisconsin and his best friend, who sort of uh, he's kind of like a LSD casualty that uh, plays guitar. And it, he he this 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 guy Mark Borchardt is. He has such passion for making a movie, but he can't really get his act together. But the move, it's you you call it you fall in love with these two guys. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a buddy uh movie, really. I won't spoil too much of it for you, but we quote it endlessly. It's it's <laughs> awesome. You know, it so we quote that Big Lebowski's easy, you know. Um what else? Gosh. Uh we all we all just saw uh, um Deadpool and Wolverine, and we all just, nobody had anything bad to say about it. We all came out of the theater going, yeah, I don't remember the last time we all went to the movies, like physically went to the movies. And that was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. So that's Bands nice. never get the time to do that kind of stuff. It's cool that after all these years that you guys still like want to do that. It's one of the greatest perks. You know, hey, touring is hard work and all that. <laughs> but one of the... One of the greatest perks is on days off, you're with your buddies and it's like, okay, where do you guys want to go to eat? Like, what do you guys want to do? And there's, there's a, there's a lot of things that were like, Hey, we all, there, there, there's uh, there, there's lots to do, but it's like, wow, we get to go to this really cool restaurant and have a bunch of laughs. And if we were all at home, this would never happen. There's too much going on. We're all married dudes with kids. Like, there's no way. So we definitely get, you get that sort of extra um, bonus where it's like, yeah, all right, playing the show is wonderful. And that that really does kind of keep you young. But the the bonus of going out and just being a bunch of goofs at a restaurant and, and, and watching movies, it's great. Well, the tour is going to be in New England on August 21st at the Xfinity Center. Creed, Three Doors Down, Finger Eleven. The new single, Adrenaline, is out. The video, I can't wait to see it. Neither can Me you. Me neither. Because it's not ready yet. <laughs> and then we'll get the new album at some point next year when it's done. Absolutely. Lots of exciting stuff with Finger Eleven. As a fan, I'm very happy that we're in this whole new phase of the band. So I'm super excited for you. Oh, uh, thanks a lot. It's really nice to kind of come back and reacquaint with everyone. Thank you so much for your time. It was so nice to see you. That was really, really fun. Thank you so much. There he is, Scott Anderson from Finger Eleven, the band out on the Summer of 99 tour with Creed and Three Doors Down. You want to find out if they're coming to a town near you? Check Scott's links and the Finger Eleven links in the show notes of this episode. And if you want to check out their new single, Adrenaline, you can also click the link for this episode's corresponding playlist. I make a playlist for every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast that features all of my guest music and all the artists and songs that we referenced in the interview. You'll also find all the Mistress Carrie links, too. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, every weekday, you get the sit rep. The Situation Report gives you all of your rock news, music headlines, and entertainment updates in about five minutes. And you never know when we're going to release a bonus episode. You can join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern for my weekly streaming video show, Cocktails in the War Room. And you can always find me on the radio. Shop in the online store, check the concert calendar, and so much more at mistresscarry.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.